so you're seeing some things in the therapy room that really got you thinking about this yeah. stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 And the, uh, you know, helping people to learn about things cognitively isn't always the way to do it. But, you know, they they need to feel it more on um, a felt level, on more of a, a relational level. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so that sounds like a really important thing to know in terms of working with that client group in therapy. Yeah. 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 Before I ask you about that, and it's, it's, that's very tempting, I want to ask you what you know about brains, because I know you said to me, John, ask me what I know about brains. And <laughs> Well, it's yeah. fascinating, because as I was reading about brains, um, uh, I, 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 uh, first of all, I was reading this book written about uh, uh, brains. Uh, I think it, it's called The Interface of Psychotherapy and Neurobiology by a guy called Louis Coslione or something like that. I was going to bring the book upstairs, but I've forgotten. Um, and he, he he's he's written quite a lot about it. And, and he helped me to understand where it all began, really, because he said Freud was the first person who was really interested about brains. But, of course, what we know about Freud is he got himself into trouble because he wrote, a, he wrote about um, what he said was children had sexual feelings and he wrote about the Oedipal complex. So he didn't do... Uh, psychoanalysts any good really so he decided he'd better not go into that area and stir up another hornet's nest so he kind of put it on the back boiler so um, it wasn't until much later on that psychotherapists began to make um, realizations that actually um, people are uh, um, affected emotionally and that is to do with the brain it isn't just to do with the emotion so they began to connect brain with emotion and what happens inside the brain when people become uh, emotionally stimulated. Um, and uh, a guy called, um, I've written it down because I've got terrible memory. Um, in the 1970s, Paul McLean, a new neuroscientist, presented a, a theory which I thought was really interesting of prom uh, primitive evolutionary structures within the brain called the triune brain. Uh, which means that our brains have three parts. Okay. Uh, and what he said was, um, and obviously this is now a, a, a known fact, that uh, we have an earlier reptilian brain, which is kind of at the bottom of the brainstem, and it's the first part of the brain that gets developed. Um, and that part of the brain is responsible for hunger and digestion and um, breathing and circulation and our temperature and movement and also our fight and flight responses yeah mm -hmm. so it's our early warning system part of our brain which is important to remember um, and then we've got the second part of our brain is the mammalian brain which is uh, is uh, um, important for rage and fear and separation and distress caring and nurturing, social bonding, playfulness, our, and our, our explorative urge, you know, where we, we get curious and want to go and explore, and also lust in adults, to sort of mention that one. Okay. And, and lastly, our higher brain, and our higher brain, which is the, the, uh, the, the, the brain in which our, uh, the latest part of our brain, which becomes more developed as we get older and older, um, is the is the rational brain what we call the, the more rational part of our brain, uh, and that's uh, responsible for our creativity and our imagination, our problem solving, and how we reason and how we reflect, um, and our self awareness and our kindness, empathy and concern. So that's the three triune brain system, mm -hmm. and of course. There is a lot, lot more, a lot, lot more about us, um, which helps us to become the people we are and helps us to learn how to respond to the world about us uh, and helps us to, to know how to regulate ourselves. But there's other aspects of the brain that need to be developed. And our brain's quite a, a complex system. Do you want me to tell you some more about yeah. it? Well, we'll before questions. we do that, I just want to catch what you're saying about regulating. And just yeah. when you think about emotional regulating, when you think about that with your clients, yeah. what, what do you mean, Steph? Just so that we've kind of got that clear. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, when I think about emotional regulation, what it is is that we can, we can help ourselves 
calm ourselves when we're anxious yeah mm. that somehow we are able to take ourselves from the fight and fight place that we can get into sometimes in the more extreme circumstances to a place where we're calmer and much more grounded mm. so that's what i think about when i think about emotional regulation so very often in my therapy room what i will see is people who haven't been able to achieve that in a very effective way so what I might see instead is that uh, instead of emotionally um, being able to emotionally regulate, they'll have panic attacks, yeah, mm-hmm. or they'll have they'll become very very highly anxious, or at the other end of the spectrum they'll be depressed because instead of being able to be with how they feel, they'll suppress how they feel, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's what I mean about emotional regulation. Yeah. So yeah. to move out of that fight or flight response into a more yes. calm calm place and yeah. there was a question in the chat room that might kind of match what we're talking about just now but I'll, I'll ask it and we can see do you okay. feel that high cortisol levels affect child development so absolutely i absolutely do because um to understand a little bit about that um, when we have a flight or flight response what happens in our brain is our amygdala um, sends a message to our hypothalamus, uh, which then releases uh, a message through our pituitary gland down to our, our um, adrenaline glands, which then release the cortisol. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what the cortisol does in our bodies is it turns everything else off. So it stops you from thinking clearly. So I don't know whether you've had an experience, for example, like you're just going out the door, you're late for a meeting and you lose your car keys. Yes. Yeah. yes. What yes. happens? You can't think. Yeah. Oh, my God, I can't find my car keys. And you're rushing about like a mad thing and you cannot find them. And then when you finally calm yourself down, because most of us can do that, and we sit down, we actually see them sitting on the table in front of us. Yeah. So what happens when we get like that, what we're doing is producing high levels of cortisol and it shuts down bodily functions, mainly for the reason that what it's doing is telling us to get ready to fight or flight. So it stops our immune system as well. So it stops everything working properly. So in answer to the question, yes, it's very damaging because If a child is in a family where that is always happening to them and there's not anybody around to help them soothe themselves, you know, there's no responsible adult that says it's okay, you know, I'm here, I'll help you soothe yourself, Um, uh, mummy's going to help you or it's okay, don't worry, Um, that won't turn off, that will just keep being pumped Uh, And in terms of children's development, that's quite damaging because what it can do is it can destroy cells in their brain and it can shrink the hypothalamus as well. So it's very, very destructive. It doesn't turn off. Yeah, so if the child's continually stimulated in that way, continually frightened or anxious, the cortisol levels will keep flowing. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, what will happen is they become hypervigilant. Mm. Uh, and what you might see then is that child will then grow up very hypervigilant mm. and yeah. likely be highly anxious. Uh, uh, and obviously, that has an impact on how they are as adults. So they're likely to you know, be depressed or have high anxiety or have eating disorders or you know issues around being able to cope with life, they'll find another way. So they might self-medicate with drugs or alcohol, if, for example. I'm talking about extreme uh, circumstances here. I mean, obviously, not everyone's going to be like that because yeah. some of yeah. us access therapy, some of us have other ways of being able to help ourselves. So if I just catch what the brain needs...